um, probably took me a little while to um, to really figure out to, yeah, there's things that I can teach them and that's great, but there's a lot that they're already good at. So let them do it. Yeah. I don't know if you saw my face or that was captured on camera, but yeah, I was like, I don't want two of me stuff that. What the hell? <laughs> I- Welcome to Exphys Biz with me, Aaron King podcast for exercise physiologists and health professionals wanting to grow and scale in business. Welcome to XFizBiz Biz uh, with me, Aaron King, and I've got Sarah Woodruff with, with me from Simply Stronger. How are you doing? Hey, Aaron. How are you doing? I'm uh, good. Well, uh, that's good. Uh, so you've come up from Victoria just to roam about and see some EP practices or what are you doing here? Yeah, pretty much. So um, I last year I took a step back from um, seeing clients myself uh, to run my business and realised that a lot of the EP practice owners that I knew were in this similar kind of situation to me, that they had worked as an EP and kind of fell into ownership eventually and decided that what I needed to do was to broaden my horizons and look at other different EP practices. And you'd know yourself, the variety of practices Mm. out there is really broad. So it's been great to be able to go out and see, like actually go into clinics and see how people run their spaces um, and see what kind of things would work well at Simply Stronger, what um, has reaffirmed things that we do do well already and and how I want um, the future of Simply Stronger to go. Yeah, so uh, how many places have you visited so far? In this trip, I've been... This is not your first trip? (laughs) No, so um, last year I came up to Sydney once um, as well, but I also went to Brisbane when I was on my way back from an international trip um, to Palau. So (laughs) it just stopped in Brisbane. So I went and saw a couple of clinics up there. Um, And then this time around, I've been to about four or five different clinics. Yeah. Uh, and you saw a footy game or something or with, uh, with um, footy? Yeah, so I'm going to some rugby league on Friday night, the Storm playing Manly. You're a Storm supporter, I imagine? I am a Storm supporter. Yeah, definitely not Manly. <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought you might say, oh, well, I don't even support the uh, the sport and more of an AFL. from Melbourne. We that's support what, every sport. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I thought. So what have you taken from some of the EP practices? Like how are they operating? Well, what kind of operations are out there that you've seen? Yeah, so I've been to um, some small offices that are just a sole practitioner and seeing the way that they run and the way that they have chosen to really niche down into their um, clientele and who they can service well. While I've been to other uh, bigger practices that um, have a really broad market of clients that they see. Some that in New South Wales you guys see a lot more um, around uh, work cover than what we do in Victoria. The funding is very, very different. So um, it's not as sustainable in that space. And um, certainly at Simply Stronger, we are built mostly off a private client base with a reasonable amount of NDIS and we get a lot of Medicare referrals coming through but it's been it's been really interesting seeing the different ones even uh caught up with rehab on the road danny miller who's you know traveling around and saw her little set up in the back of her van that she takes around and you know runs group classes in halls and things so just different ideas that you might not think of yes i think the sole provider sole practitioner is probably the most common type of ep uh, business starting out as a um, self-employed person and then it develops from there because like, obviously it takes a, a bit of work to go from the sole practitioner into or self-employed into uh, ownership you know so definitely an understanding that you can try to find a way to operate an EP in itself is so broad that you can take many routes like even in our practice here we've got uh, sports and athletes NDIS work cover private clients um, every third party scheme that's possible, as well as many other private styles that uh, operate. So we've got that accessibility and um, that availability to do that. And for us, we like the 
the variety of that. But I do know that having the variety of not really knowing what's going to happen on the day yeah. doesn't really suit everybody. So it's, I'm not saying that the way that I operate is the best for everybody. It's just, we like the variety and it comes with, I guess, private practice ownership, unless you're niching down to a specific area. And you will find like, even though we didn't initially niche to begin with, but over time you do kind of find where you fit in the uh, fit in the scheme as things go along. Like you mentioned at Simply Stronger, you have, you know, your, your main market is sort of the uh, old adults. Would that be right if I can say yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. 60 to 70 semi-retired um, clients are, are a big part of our clientele. Um, I think uh, our next after that is 30 to 40. And I, I would hazard a guess that some of that is um, because that was my age group when I was coming through as um, a sole trader and then a business owner. So it was word of mouth from people that I knew. But I think it's also that demographic have um, a little bit more disposable income and they're starting to realise that they don't bounce back from the injuries like they used to in their 20s and they're not you know, as fit and active as they were with the organised sports and, and things like that. So they start to look elsewhere to achieve those goals. Yeah, well, I'd say that people in middle age are the main clientele or the main age category that we have here as well. And I say that only because I'm also in middle age, middle <laughs> age as well. I don't feel like it mentally, but biologically probably yes. Hopefully just under, but I am in my 40s, so there you go. So probably. Yeah, no, I just um, ticked over 40 myself. <laughs> so there, there we go. And yeah, I, you do find you relate to different people in the way because, you know, someone knows, okay, I've, I've got kids, I'm 40, like, somebody that has a similar experience can relate to me where I still relate somewhat to some of our junior athletes, but maybe they're better off with, with someone that's maybe a bit younger that can, I don't know, to talk their language a bit, a bit more at times. Um, yeah, so, yeah. I, think, I think it's interesting, isn't it? So sometimes um, you'll get clients coming in and what they really want is to be able to have that maturity and they're, and they're looking at people like us and going, well, clearly you have a lot more experience. Yeah, but so I'm not saying that's the best. Recently. Yes. Well, yeah. more, more on that later, but we can yeah. expand on that because <laughs> I, I also agree. Versus, you know, they want someone that they can relate to and like watching my staff, the way that they talk about Pokemon and <laughs> other video games and things that I have no idea about. And the kids are just lapping it up. They're loving it. It works so well for them. <laughs> not uh, my thing. <laughs> interesting that you mentioned Pokemon because we have a couple of clients that that's their real special interest and they talk about that and yeah i've got no idea so they're set up with somebody that is a little bit younger that was maybe younger when pokemon mm -hmm. started to become popular and had some exposure and experience and they also had to go do some extra research because <laughs> they at least wanted to be able to keep up who thought um, that would be part of your job researching pokemon yeah so you know, there are a lot of things in the EP world that you go, well, I didn't realize that was part of my job description. Like we've got a student at the moment and some of the main things are, look, I didn't realize that, you know, the behaviors of certain clients, because they come from a, a textbook of, you know, this is one way to do it. This is the best way to do it. And then you've just really got to adapt it for the person on the day, whether they're dealing with certain uh, health conditions, that they've got certain diagnoses that mean that they, they act or behave a, a certain way, or they have, they can do things or they may not. How they may have limited ability to do certain movements and have some level of restriction that you can't always treat them like a textbook. You've got to go, well, you've got to treat them as a person. And are they, are they getting to their goals? Are they doing it in a safe environment? Well, as long as you tick both those boxes, it probably doesn't matter. Is, is their technique all right? Well, What's technique, yeah, it, what's technique anyway? Yeah. I mean, there's, like, I certainly came through from a personal training into an EP background and technique was something that was so important. And you learn to evolve that, to be in front of the body in front, the body that's in front of you. How regimented do you need to be in that? If they're moving, isn't that the goal? And if they're, as long as they're not going to, hurt themselves in some way, they're lifting well, then let it go. Yeah, I think it comes down to what they're trying to perform. Well, obviously, if you're trying to lift the maximum and you're a power lifter and there's a path of released resistance that you're trying to achieve, sure, there's a better technique. Absolutely. But if it's the average person that is working you know, in a challenging capacity that their goal is to improve on whatever their health is, will put up less barriers rather than more. Yeah, yeah.
Couldn't agree more. And yeah, I think that's the unfortunate thing about some social media as well. Like people are creating a problem to sell a solution and creating a barrier that doesn't absolutely need to be there. Oh, I'm the fear mongering. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned that your niche at Simply Strong, or not really a niche, but your main market has been that 60 to 70 year old. Did that just happen organically or did you sort of find that or fell into it? I think it's probably um, something to do with the demographic of where we are. So when I, um, I've, even before I started Simply Stronger, I'd worked in the same um, geographical area for about oh, five or six years beforehand anyway. Um, and that area, um, that's quite a large proportion of the people that are there. So it was younger families and the 60 to 7 year olds. So that's, I think it did happen quite organically. And, and for me, my background was always musculoskeletal. So I would spend most of my time working with people, helping them to just generally get stronger, work through whatever pain or injuries that they had or whatever else was going on. And um, then they would just refer their friends who also had aches and pains and things going on. So, and so you figure out which clients you like and then go, do you have any friends? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, was that yeah. where you grew up, where you started your practice? Certainly where I started my practice, I had, it's where I was after uni, but I grew up probably only about 20 k's east, realistically, but not too far away. I, I knew the area. Which is why I was asking, because you can, you tend to be able to relate to people with similar experiences and it does help. Like I, I grew up probably you know, 10, 15 minutes from here. And that's why I started in this area because I understood it and people understood me when they realized I'm also a Westie. So like, um, <laughs> that, that just were, worked out when I worked more over the, the north and the other, other side of the Harbour Bridge. Mm -hmm. Like, where are you from? And no idea. And sort of <laughs> there was a, a bit of a more difficult uh, connection. Oh, my gosh, you're from the other side of the bridge. Ooh. And <laughs> it, it's easy when you talk about, oh, why don't you go for a walk on this bike path? I was out running here the other day and things like that. You can have those conversations because you know the area and you can uh, relate to them. Yeah. And that's why I'm still operating in this area one, because I built up a client base and I'm not going to then transfer it and start all over again. Well, not initially, that's maybe in the future plans, but not transferring everything from here to there, but maybe having a second site or anything. I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn, speaking for future goals, but you know, world domination, you obviously got to start in new sites uh, and new positions as, as you grow and expand. But I definitely think starting out in business where you know and understand is going to be, um, a beneficial thing to do. Yeah, I agree. So how did you go from being an EP to then still an EP, but more of a practicing clinician to stepping away? Was that hard and who was it hardest for? Was it your clients that thought you were the best person for the job in every way because you're the, the owner when in reality um, you're not actually the best person for the clinical EP because your mind's on a million one things at once and your staff is actually much better than you at doing the, the clinical related things, but everyone wants you just because they see you as the peak. And I've just said, I've basically just described my, my own experience because it seems very common. It seems very common. Yeah, I think it, it's pretty similar. I think for me, I had gotten to the point where I was ready to take a step back from being clients, but I probably let that linger a little longer than yeah. I should have. But we were also coming from the pandemic. There'd been quite a lot of fluctuations in our staffing, in and out of lockdowns, all sorts of stuff that mm. had probably set the plans back. Not that I necessarily had a plan, but it set it back further. And I probably dragged my feet. And I mean, there's no reason why it needed to be a particular day. But of course, it was the end of the year because that was a nice round way to say it to clients. And, and we did have a few clients that stopped altogether. And when you hear practice owners saying, you know, they all just transition smoothly, it's like, yeah, most of them do. Most of them. <laughs> you, you do have to accept that there might be some changes. People won't cope with that. And you might lose a little, like, might lose 10% of your business or maybe less, maybe more, who knows, um, depending upon what you set up like. Um, but that happens anytime you have a price increase and you're so worried about like, oh, I'm going to increase it 3%, even though my costs have gone up 25% for the last 12 months. <laughs> I know, three, and they're all going to stop. They're all going to stop. They're all going to hate me personally and, for it. And to, to be honest, when like we've been transparent, any changes that we've had to make, and we have had a couple of people go, oh, look, I, 
I can't continue for uh, whatever reason because of that price increase or that change of mm -hmm. operations. And it's generally only one or two and you're still better off. You're still closer to being better off in the, in the long run, even though you've um, Absolutely. had a little bit of collateral uh, damage. Because if you're going to you know, increase at 3% or, and the cost of the operations have gone up like 25% in the last year, because everything's just gone up a little bit, which is skyrocketed everything. And that's just my own personal experience. So like when I looked at the, uh, the expenditure from one year to the next of the, the main things are like, oops, it's gone up. So that 3% is not a, it's not that bad. <laughs> no. And I think Probably people are, yeah, they're definitely just, um, no one wants to pay more. So when you are talking about a price rise, no one likes change. They don't mm -hmm. want me to stop seeing them because they have to deal with change. The fact that the EP that's seeing them is going to be more engaged in the process for them and actually doing, in my opinion, a better job than what I was doing. Um, in the end there, that they don't see that at the time. That's They'll come up to me months later and say, oh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really happy that that worked out really well. Um, and you do what you can to be able to um, manage the people. And, and I think that's something that as EPs we do really well is being able to read people and know how to um, kind of massage the personalities to um, help smooth the road there, there is a bit of that and i think with any price increase any change any change of service you're more worried than they are <laughs> yeah you, absolutely and you're you projecting are. everything on them going oh they're going to be so concerned and so like, are they though yeah they're like oh. and there's a couple that will be like i wonder when you're going to do that she you could have told me earlier i might have jumped you if i, <laughs> if I knew i had some support but yeah that like that does happen and you're more worried than what is, but you just need to accept that well, that's part of growth, that there will be some changes and not everybody will like it, but the majority of people will be okay with it and understand. Yeah. And it's it certainly, it's been the best thing for Simply Stronger. Um, for me personally, it was the change I needed in my career. Um, through the time of being a personal trainer through uni and then becoming an EP, I'd been seeing clients for 23 years. It was a long time. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I started personal training when I was going to uni at 19 and I'm, well, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, I think 22, 23, yeah, yeah, yeah about there. Played the same game. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was just, it was time for me to, um, to shift my job focus and that, you know, if you're working somewhere else, that might be resigning and moving into a different job, but I just created a new role for myself instead. And for us, our, um, our year this year has been a, a much better financial year than what we've had in the past. I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to compare to 2020 and 2021 anyway, but in general, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely trending in the right direction. I'm able to spend a lot more time with my staff, um, mentoring them, which I was always doing that, but it was lots of little quick, sharp things rather than uh, as much. Now I get to delve into things a little bit deeper with them, which has been really good. And you can see it in them that they are happy having more autonomy on the gym floor as well. Mm. Like they're, they're just doing their thing. And every now and again, I walk through and I'm like, you see how that client is moving in this way? Maybe you could try this. It's a great idea. So you just drop little nuggets. They still think that you know all the things. <laughs> they know I don't know all the things because they, I've told, I've told them, I don't know all the things you guys probably know more than me, so mm. roll with it. But from the perception is that the, the owner, the director, the senior EP, whatever role name you have for, they're like, I just call myself one of the EPs here to majority of people. And it's only a few, like a couple of months, oh, like you, the owner. Yes, because <laughs> I, I don't really care about the titles. I don't want that perception of I've got to treat or act differently or anything like that. I'm just, no, I'm just one of the guys. No, but it, it, every now and again when you'll get someone calling in and it's like, this didn't work and that didn't work, and it's like, that's fine, I can fix that for you. And they're like, oh, can you? And I'm like, yes, yes, I can. <laughs> don't, don't tell everybody this show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially when the phone rings and like, oh, can I speak to the owner? No, sorry, they're not here. Who is calling? I'll take a message. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, then, but then if they walk in and they see the pictures on the wall behind us about the awards and stuff and they see me and a few of them, they're like, oh, okay, you're the guy I need to speak to. Damn it. 
busted. <laughs> I'm just the manager, actually. The owner, the owner's upstairs. <laughs> yeah, so it just it depends what they what they come in for because you do like you probably find that you get I'll call it hassled like multiple times a week, sometimes multiple times a day with just random cold calls of hey, can I speak to the owner and just I want to try to sell them something that they don't need. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you need to upgrade your order system? Why? Solar. Why? Hot water. <laughs> they're, they're, they're the two ones hot at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, I don't know what tangent we went on there, but there we go. So how did, did you remove yourself? Did you just say from that date at the end of the year, I will be stepping back and send a letter or a notification to all your clients or was it a more of a, a soft sell? Uh, so I'd already worked myself down to only being about 10 hours of clients and then I gave them... Um, uh, it was a good month's notice, if not more, um, face to face. It went out in emails as well, um, all with very positive tones about how we're going to be able to, um, you know, the different things that Sarah's going to be available for now because I'm not seeing clients. And that's the truth. You will oh, be a, like a better owner, director, senior EP, whatever you, I don't know. What do you call yourself? I don't know if I asked that. Director, but I find it weird. Yeah. <laughs> owner, director, I don't know. Like on my email it says director, but I, I generally, I've tried to start actually when people say, oh, what do you do? Be like, oh, I'm a business owner as opposed to I'm an yeah. exercise physiologist. Yeah, I don't think, my mine still has my initials on my signature, but it doesn't actually have exercise physiologist on it. I, I'd, I'd, so I have the uh, initials the registration initials, but I yep. don't have exercise physiology. I think it mine just says manager. Actually, I've got to double check. Yeah. Not, I might be wrong, <laughs> but it should have. I did change it for a while to say just managing director. I'm, I'm thinking now maybe I did change it back and have the dual title, but I don't think I did it. No, I'm pretty sure it says managing director <laughs> with, the, with, with, with the things for that reason as well. Yeah. I'm trying to remove myself as the main EP that people go to and ask things that my team are shitloads better at than me. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, my team, they have trained so much more recently than I have. They know so much more about chronic conditions and things. Um, you know, my, my skill set is being able to modify the exercise in front of the, for the body that's in front of me, mm. right? So I can teach them that. That's easy. And they are so much better at seeing the client. And we're back just a little bit of a break in play. I don't know how long the, uh, the video paused for, but hopefully it's not too long. And what I'm saying now to people listening doesn't make any sense. That's the, <laughs> that's the plan. So you removed yourself from the business. How did you do that successfully? Uh, so I'd already worked myself down to being only about 10 hours with clients uh, and then spoke to each of them face-to-face -face in the appointments that I was seeing them and sent out emails to all of our clients to let them know that that was going to be the case because for quite some time we'd already been saying to new people coming in that um, Sarah's not taking on any new clients and things like that had uh, paved the way for the transition. I'd spent a lot of time with the staff that were taking over the clients so that the clients felt supported. Um, we then had one of those staff members um, finish up after he'd been seeing my clients exclusively for probably two or three months and then he was leaving. So then we had a new grad come in and fill that space. So it's making sure that everyone felt like they were supported um, and we probably had more clients stop. And when I say stop, four maybe stopped after seeing, um, not being able to see me than we did in the transition from one employee to the next, you mm. know, which I'm sure you know yourself. There's always a change in that. Yeah, that, that happens whether it's a price increase, price change, so change of service of how you're operating or a different system you've implemented to improve things or just removing yourself from a practitioner role and going that. There is always a bit of um, a bit of people that maybe don't, don't want the change or they were specifically seeing you and they were really happy with that, which is great. You you get a couple, and every time we've made changes, it's probably been one or two. But overall, it's like, well, we're losing one or two, which is not um, great if that's the type of business that you operate. Um, and I'm referring to like we're not obviously trying to keep the people that are intake, treat, discharge, but it's those ongoing people because you should recommend that exercise is a lifetime thing. Yeah, you're obviously able to remove yourself from the business, and 
you ended up doing better by removing yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I was going with that. That, um, yeah, we've had this year, we've been better off financially since then with me working in the business, which is nice to be able to affirm that I was doing the right thing, making the right choices. And sometimes you're your own roadblock. Absolutely. And, and I say that because <laughs> I also agree. So what does the future hold for Simply Stronger? Many things. So I want to definitely keep growing our team and being able to service more and more people. Um, and I love the idea of being able to one day open it as a gym. So I um, used to work as a personal trainer and, and in gyms and spaces like that back before even Certificate 4 was a thing or was first coming in. And you had gym instructors on the floor to be able to help people. And I think that's a space that EPs and exercise scientists could be brilliant at in being able to actually support people rather than going to a 24-7 gym where there is no support and no care whatsoever to what you're doing and how you're doing it. Getting people to exercise well is going to only help them to continue to be um, more compliant but have a much healthier relationship with exercise because they've got the support from people who are trained and know what they're doing. Yeah, I think uh, just needing to see where you want to fit and hopefully that you can see that you can go down the clinical route, but you also don't need to necessarily be 100% highly clinical because even with training general clients, some of it turns up to be quite clinical <laughs> uh, uh, anyway. Yeah, it comes around again, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so that's good. It was great to chat to you. And I was a little bit nervous with the end of this, staring at the screen like, oh, hopefully that works. Yeah. But hopefully nobody listening knows what we're talking about because it was all smooth once I cut it, but probably not because <laughs> I don't know how long it, uh, it froze for a, a moment. But that's what happens when you're working with uh, streaming online, just sometimes these things happen, but yep. we'll be back and I'm sure we'll chat again. So thanks, yeah, for, that'd be great. thanks, for, thanks for coming up. Um, thanks I was for about to say me. coming down, uh, coming up and chat soon will be, where can people find you? Easy. So you can find me on Instagram. You will find me on LinkedIn. You will find me on my website, simplystronger.com.au. On Instagram, I think it's uh, Sarah Woodroff EP. There'll be underscores in there. You'll find it. Where I can put these in the in the description, so yeah, I'll find it. That's in. more helpful, isn't it? Yeah. LinkedIn, type in my name, Sarah without a H. Yeah, yep. cool. <laughs> Important. <laughs> All right. So if there's one question you could, or one answer you could give to, you know, what do you wish you know now in business that you wish you knew when you got started? So some advice for EPs in business out there. Yeah. Okay. So one thing that I think got stuck in my head for a long while and I didn't realize it was there was I had a lot of clients telling me when I had started my business and was looking to employ people to all I need is just a clone of me and to do the same thing as me. And <laughs> that's obviously never, I mean, you can't make them anyway, but, and it's never going to work, but I think in the back of my head, like I was trying to train people to do what I do instead of embracing what they do and and allowing their strengths. And that um, probably took me a little while to, um, to really figure out to, yeah, there's things that I can teach them and that's great, but there's a lot that they're already good at. So let them do it. Yeah, I don't know if you saw my face or that was captured on camera, but yeah, I was like, I don't want two of me, stuff that. What the hell? I <laughs> You think you need to look at where your weaknesses are and probably hire people to sort of fill in, fill in your gaps uh, as well. So I think that's a, an important step. So uh, thanks for uh, coming in and we'll speak soon. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. No worries. Thank you. You've just listened to another episode of XFiz Biz. If you've got some value out of the content, make sure that you like, share, follow or subscribe. Until next time.